Good, good morning, folks. This is lecture 18 of the Mechanical Vibrations course in summer of 2024. Uh, please uh, uh, make sure you don't put your guards down because the remaining three weeks of the course and the stuff that we're going to be covering is very is very computationally intensive. And therefore, it, it is it's important you uh, pay close attention, watch the, watch the videos or come to class and also uh, do the homework problems, although they're not mandatory. And uh, let's go through the course agenda. Point, we're going to abandon the concept of single degree of freedom, uh, which we have been dealing with in the last nine weeks, and move on to two degrees of freedom. Pretty much everything that we do is going to be involving two degrees of freedom, because anything beyond two is... The, the strategy and the plan of attack is exactly the same at two degrees of freedom, except that uh, things are messier. Instead of two by two matrices, you're going to be dealing with uh, n by n matrices if you have n degrees of freedom. Okay, and obviously uh, item number two will appear as we go along. Natural frequencies of a, a multi-degree of freedom system, two degree of freedom system, and the corresponding uh, vibration modes are going to pop up as we move along. Now let's consider these two masses, and they are attached like that, and each one of them uh, can move by the amount x1 and x2. Just the very fact that you have two masses doesn't necessarily mean it's a two degree of freedom system. The degrees of freedom means that the independent, the minimum number of independent parameters that determine the position of the, the system as a whole. In this case, you can hold, for example, block one stationary, you can grab it, hold it, and then mass two can move by itself. That's one degree of freedom. Or you can hold mass two and mass one can move by itself. So there are two, de two independent parameters determine the position of this mass. So for example, if you look at the diagram on the right, there is one mass, but still this is a two degree of freedom system because the fact that you have one mass doesn't necessarily mean it's a single degree of freedom system. It's just that x1 and x2 in that diagram tell you exactly how many degrees of freedom you have, two of them. These are independent. Two. Or in a situation like that where maybe uh, there's a, a torsional stiffness here, a torsional spring, so this is also two degrees of freedom because the, the unique position of the mass is determined by how much it goes down and by how much it rotates about that axis. Okay, let's concentrate on this and draw the free body diagram of this structure. So uh, let's, let's, let's say that, uh, well, the situation is shown here, x1 and x2 to the right, so what happens is that when you look at mass 2 alone by itself, mass 2 alone by itself, the spring says, the spring K2 says, uh, no, 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 you can't go. So it, it imposes an opposite force to the motion of uh, uh, the mass 2. Now, because uh, action equal to reaction and these springs do not have any mass, this force is exactly the opposite of the force that's applied on M1. Okay? And of course, the spring K1 also says you can't go, so it puts a force, which is K1, X1. So the free body diagram of these things are draw drawn. Let us write down the sum of all the forces on mass 1 equal to mass times acceleration. We get this. And sum of all the forces on mass 2 equal to uh, mass times acceleration. And we get this. Okay? Everything to the right is positive. That's why, for example, this is positive, this is negative, and this one, when you, when you write the equation of motion for M2, this is going to be negative. Now, you can clean this up, and it's going to, you can take everything to one side, and it's going to look like that. Two equations, two differential equations, which give you position on X, the masses 1 and 2, namely X1 and X2. If you could solve this, for x1 as a function of time and x2 as a function of time, we'll get the position of the masses 
and the entire system at any time. The only problem is that these are coupled. You cannot just solve the top equation by itself because x1, uh, x2 appears also in the top equation and obviously x1 appears in the bottom equation. These are coupled equations. Now, of course, to solve a differential equation, you need uh, initial conditions. And in this case, you need four initial conditions. In other words, tell me where the mass m1 is and what its velocity is at time t equal to 0. Tell me where the mass m2 is and its, uh, and its velocity at time t equal to 0. You need four conditions to solve this differential equation. OK. We're going, to, we're going to write things in the form of a matrix. That's why I put x1 and x2, which are the solutions of uh, uh, the, the displacement of mass 1 and mass 2 in a vector like that. It's a lot easier to handle things in a vector form than individual scalars. Now, notice also, uh, at least in men, when they use a bold letter, bold letter, uh, it, it means that it's a vector. We try to do that. Sometimes it's inevitable. You can't do it. But anyway, Inman, Inman tries to, whenever it's a bold x, it means that vector x consisting of two components, and the two components are x1 and x2, not both. Now, if you take this thing and differentiate it, obviously you're going to get derivative of the first component and derivative of the second component. And x double dot is going to be, the vector x double dot is going to be x1 double dot and x2 double dot. These are obvious. Okay. Now, let us define a matrix M, which goes like that. So it's a diagonal matrix, and it's symmetric. You can see that. And a stiffness matrix, which looks like that. A matrix which looks like that, because that equation, the two, the two coupled equation, I want to write it for you in an efficient matrix form. Both this M and K are symmetric, obviously. Now, this was the equation that we had on the previous page, equation of motion for the two masses. If you clean this up, you can see that it's going to be a matrix, this M, times vector of acceleration, plus this matrix, this matrix K, which is called the stiffness matrix, times the position, x1 and x2 equal to 0. This looks like a good old single degree of freedom system, mass times acceleration plus stiffness k times displacement equal to 0, except that things are now in a matrix form or in vector form. So people write it like that. M, mass matrix, x double dot, acceleration vector plus kx, which is the spring, spring force basically equal to zero. Now, written for your convenience here, once again, we need four initial conditions. In other words, give me position of x1 and x2, mass 1 and mass 2 at term zero, and give me the velocities of mass 1 and mass 2 at term t equal to zero. Essentially, we have these four pieces of information that we need, but in the car, if you put them in vector form, there is this vector, pos initial position vector, and initial velocity vector, which are to be supplied in order to be able for us to solve the equation. Now, let us, let, let me assume that this vector x, the unknown vector x, is, which is a function of time, by the way, is a constant vector times this function. Now, you might say, wait a minute, where did this come from? Well, first of all, j is square root of minus 1. Now, there is no reason why we should go to complex solutions. We could have said vector x equal to a constant vector times cosine of omega t, or vector x equal to constant vector times sine of omega t. I could get away not using complex numbers at all, just use like that. Now, this is not coming out of nowhere. There is something called Euler's formula. 
e to the j omega t, or let's think about it like that. e to the j omega t is uh, cos omega t uh, plus j sine omega t. That's called Euler's formula, okay? Uh, so let's not get hung up on this. Either this, the top one, the bottom one, or the last one. The middle one or the last one. Okay, if I differentiate this, because u is a constant, essentially I differentiate e to the j omega t. That's why I get a... Sorry, there is a, there is a mistake here. There is a mistake here. There is a j missing. So derivative of e to the j omega t is j omega e to the j omega t. I will fix this thing. Uh, well, I can't fix it. <laughs> so there's a J missing here. That's as simple as that. Okay. And if you differentiate this thing one more time, you get another J omega. But J times J, J squared is minus 1. So we get minus omega squared times the constant vector U times E to the J omega T. I have also written this thing down if I took the very last expression. If I say x of t equal to a constant vector sine omega t, when you differentiate this thing, derivative of a constant vector, of whom it's just a constant, derivative of sine of omega, omega t is omega cos omega t, and you differentiate it one more time, you differentiate this thing one more time, you get a minus, you get another omega, so omega squared, constant vector u, and sine omega t. There is no mistake here. There was a mistake up there where j is left out. Okay. Now, before we do the rest of the problem, in this part of the course, because we're dealing with two degrees of freedom, sometimes you have to invert a two by two matrix. And this is a very simple expression. Uh, this is a simple, basically the recipe for inverting, inverting the matrix. So it's going to be determinant, you know what it is, it's AD minus BC. And the inverse of this matrix is one over determinant. All you do is to swap these two, you see that? D goes up there, A goes down here, and these these numbers to turn to minus, okay? Uh, so uh, mi minus, minus, swap these. This is called, this is a very simple way of inverting a two by two matrix. Okay, let's move on. So for your convenience, I'm not using J, I wrote it like that, X equal to U bar sine omega T, differentiate it, you get omega and cosine, and differentiate again, you get minus omega squared sine. Now, I take these guys, I take these guys, and put it in this mother of all equations. I, I don't have a damn thing, <laughs> but it looks like a mother of all equation for vector form, okay? So if you do that, notice that there's a sine of omega t, because there is no damping here, this doesn't come into the picture, these two come, the sine of omega t is a constant. You can a u type sine of omega t is a is common between these two. Take it out, so you get minus m omega square. See, if you take this thing and multiply it by m, you get minus omega square times m uh, plus k equal to zero. First of all, sine omega t. If this is zero for any t, I can divide through by sine omega t and say that this must be zero. Okay. So for this to be true for any t, then what it requires is that the product of the this matrix and that vector must be zero. Now, that looks familiar. Remember, in, in, your, uh, in your linear algebra course, you had a situation where a matrix, matrix, specifically that matrix that I'm referring to, just remember, it was a minus lambda i times a vector equal to zero. Didn't we call lambda eigenvalue and the, the vector, eigenvector? Well, this is almost like that, okay? This is, not, this is not a, this is not i, but it's almost like that. This is why it's called a generalized eigenvalue. This omega, the omega squared plays the role of your eigenvalue and u bar plays the role of your eigenvector, okay? Later on, we're going to call you bar a mode shape, but anyway, let's not worry about that. Essentially, this got to be zero. Now, 
how can the product of a matrix and a vector be zero? Well, one way, if u is zero, but if u is zero, that's totally useless because it says that x is zero. That, that these blocks don't move at all, right? Because after all, if u is zero, the position of the two masses, x1 and x2, which are components of this vector, are zero, and that's totally useless. So this cannot be zero. How can a matrix times a, a vector which is not zero be equal to zero? The only way that can happen is that if the determinant of this thing is zero. So the only way you can be a non-zero vector is that if this is zero, OK? That's exactly the kind of thing that we did. When you, uh, when, you, when, you, you did, when you took your linear algebra class, you said determinant of A minus lambda I, okay? That, but that was a standard eigenvalue problem. This is a generalized eigenvalue problem. Therefore, that's why I don't see an I here. I see an M. And uh, the thing that was called lambda is omega squared. That, that's okay. That's all right. This omega is the natural frequency because, after all, look at it. Look at it. If I'm saying x of t equal to a constant vector, times sine omega t, that means these masses, m1 and m2, are moving at that frequency because it's a constant value, first component of u times sine omega t, second component of u times sine omega t. Basically, it says that masses m1 and m2 are, 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 are oscillating at frequency omega. Okay? That's why these are called natural frequencies. Now, Unfortunately, or, or I don't know, when, whenever we did single degree of freedom, when I put, when I wanted natural frequency, I called it omega n. We are not going to do that here because there are uh, that's going to cause a cause a confusion. So every time we say uh, in this context omega, this is the natural frequency. I'm not going to write omega n squared. Okay. Now. Once you find the natural frequency omega, then you go and find this vector u. And this vector u is called the mode for each uh, uh, natural frequency. Okay? It's, it's, it plays the role of your eigenvector as you did in your al linear algebra class. Okay, let's remember. That's the situation. This is the, this is the equation that we have to solve to find omega. First, find the natural frequency and u, which is called the mode later. OK. Written here for your convenience. So determinant of this must be 0. Well, let's write down. What is m? m was m1 and m2. Remember, matrix m was a diagonal matrix, m1, 0, 0, m2. Remember, this matrix k was actually right here, k1 plus k2 minus k2 minus k2, k2. Literally, write this thing down. Write m, write k. You're going to have determinant of this. You know how to find determinant of a two-way two matrix. This product minus that product. There we are. This product minus that product. It's written for you. Notice that it's a fourth order uh, algebraic equation. Actually, to be fair, this is not really fourth order because if you call omega square something, this is the square of that. In other words, just hypothetically, if omega square, I call it the alpha, this is alpha squared. Alpha squared minus alpha plus a constant equal to zero. But it's a fourth order fourth order uh, algebraic equation, fourth degree equation. These are called characteristic equations. Whether you talk about this or that or that, they're saying the same thing, and these are called characteristic equations. Now, when you find omega squared, you can take m plus, you can take plus or minus omega 1 and omega 2. See, when you get, like, for example, omega squared equal to 25, then omega 1 is plus 5, Omega two is my, uh, omega one is plus or minus five, and yeah, if you find omega squared is thirty six, omega two is plus or minus six. Okay. So um, as I said, this is really not a fourth fourth degree equation. Uh, it is a second order equation, and that's really what this is saying. Now, 
So we found omega 1 and omega 2, and we have to multiply it by vector u1 and u1. Vector u1, this was the eigenvector. These are omegas that we found, plus and minus. And we do the same thing for omega 2. We found plus or minus omega 2. That's why one has plus, the other has minus. Multiply by u2. Actually, this is called Euler's equation. In other words, if you, if you add these two up, one has a positive exponent, the other has a negative exponent. If you add these two up, you see that actually u1 is common. You get e to the j omega 1t plus e to the minus j omega 1t. There, you see that the sum of these two is going to be two times cosine of, uh, two times cosine of omega 1t. Okay. And if you add these two, again, you're going to get u2 times cosine of omega 2t. If you subtract them, you're going to get u1 times j, times 2, times sine. All I'm trying to tell you is that, look, instead of taking it like that, you can, if you don't like complex numbers, you can look at it like this. Where are these coming from? Where did we get sine? We took these and added them up and subtracted them. And the two that you get when you add these two up, you can divide through. Okay, these are going to be solutions. So you want sine omega 1t, you want cosine omega 1t. These, this is the eigen uh, or the eigen vector or the mode associated with omega 1. This u2 is just the same thing. These are the same thing. u2 is the eigen vector or the, uh, the mode associated with omega 2. And we'll do an example in a minute. So these are all solutions. So what is the total solution? It's a combination of these. A of this times B of that times C of that times D of that. Add them up. How do we find this A, B, C, and D? Remember, you need four conditions for initial conditions. Now, by the way, this is fine. There's nothing wrong with this. Each one of these multiplied by a constant added is going to be a total solution. But remember that whenever you have the product of things which involve the uh, sine and cosine, uh, uh, this, uh, this so, see, whenever we have sine, cosine of the same frequency, or sine, sine of the same frequency, or cosine, cosine of the same frequency, instead of writing it like this, it is possible to write it in this form. In other words, uh, you, you can combine these. Okay, whenever you have sine and sine multiplied by these constants, you can combine them so that you have a phase angle and an amplitude. Okay? Uh, and I just want to remind you what this A1 is. A1 is square root of A squared plus B squared. Mm -hmm. Same thing with this one. This A2 is square root of C squared plus D squared. So, this is a solution, but this can be massaged to look like that. This is also a solution, whichever is convenient. Let's do an example. So suppose we have a mass M19, mass M2 equal to 1. St the stiffness is K1, and the stiffness is K2, 24 and thir uh, 3. Let's write down the mass matrix. Well, here's what we have to do, first of all. Verify, well, well, first of all, find the natural frequencies and the modes. And once you do that, do something, check something out. Don't worry about B right now. Our job is to do A right now. We come back to do B, and we come back to do C. Don't worry about right now. Just A for now. So, this was M, this was K. Plug in M1 and M2, plug in K1 and K2. You get this. So, what is that matrix characteristic, uh, characteristic matrix? Minus omega squared M plus K. Now, let me remind you that if you thought that this was equal to zero, 
We're not saying it's equal to zero, but if you thought about this being equal to zero, that'll tell you that omega is the square root of k over m. Don't think about it like that, because square root of k over m, k is a matrix divided by m is a matrix. You can't do stuff like that. All I'm saying is that that you have seen in the sing single degree of freedom, it was exactly the same thing equal to zero. And that's how we got k over m, root of k over m. Here, we can't do that, but we have to write this and take the determinant of it, set it equal to zero. We are not saying this is zero. We are saying this is singular because this thing multiplied by u gave us zero. Okay, doesn't mean this is, as, this is zero, but the determinant of it must be zero. So let's literally write it down. You have your m, you have your k, just, there it is. Just, just multiply it out, this minus that. You get this expression. Do the algebra, you get this. And divide by 9, you get that. Notice that's very easy to solve. Actually, it factors omega squared minus 4 times omega squared minus 2. If you multiply that, you get this. And obviously, you get the one on the top. And you get your frequencies, plus or minus 2 plus or minus root 2. Now, notice that we don't have to take both plus and minus. We can take only the pluses because one of them will, will be multiplied by sine, the other one by cosine. Okay, so, all right, let's move. So, omega 1 is 2 rad per second. Omega 2 is root 2 rad per second. Okay, let's uh, proceed. Uh, so we just did this. We got these values. Now we have to go and find the mode. Let's find the, 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 the mode or the eigenvector, think about it like that, associated with omega 2 equal to root 2. So we have to go and plug it in here. Remember this times u1 equal to 0. Our job is to find u1. The first mode associated with, uh, this, this is a bad way of writing it. I would have liked to write this thing as u2. I would have liked to write this thing as u2, but unfortunately I didn't do that. Okay, so uh, just plug it in. Okay, uh, so uh, this thing with that value of omega2 equal to root 2, just plug it in you're going to get that equation, okay? I'm, I'm sorry about this. I would have liked to call this thing U2. Now, uh, sure, uh, let's, uh, if you look at these two equations, these are identical equations. The top equation is the bottom one multiplied by 3. That's minus 3, actually. That's all there is to it. So we really have only one equation, either the top one or the bottom one. And because we have only one equation, we have some freedom to choose u1 and u2. Because the equation that we have is minus 3u1 plus u2 equal to 0. So I arbitrarily set u2 equal to plus 1, and I'm going to get u1 equal to 1 third. So this, okay, uh, is uh, the first mode. Uh, and I'm really sorry about this thing. If I had called this thing omega 1 instead of omega 2, I would, this still would be, would all make sense. There's nothing wrong with this thing, it's, except that I don't know why I, I, I started with omega 2. If I had called this thing omega 1, uh, this would have been, everything would have been fine. It's just that terrible. Okay. <laughs> uh, now let's go ahead and uh, take the other uh, frequency. Omega 1 equal to 2, omega equal to 2, plug it in the corresponding equation, except that instead of root 2, you have 2. Just just plug it in. Plug it in here. Okay? Now, yeah. And uh, the equation, if you write this thing, equation going to look that, where omega 1 is actually 2. Just literally plug it in. Once again, these two equations are identical. One is three times the other one. So really, I have freedom to choose one of these variables, u1 and u2. So arbitrarily, I'm setting u2 equal to plus 1. 
and that will give me u1 equal to minus one third, and I found the second mode. First mode, second mode. Okay, this goes with root two, this goes with two. Okay, just keep that in mind. Now, what do we mean by orthogonality? Notice that I found a u1 and u2. If you find the dot product, if you find the dot product of these two, you don't get zero. You get some number. But, but if you do, if you put an n between them, in other words, u2 dotted with mu1, and this is one way of writing it, you do get zero. And the same thing, if you take u2 dotted with ku1, you get zero. So these two modes that I got, they are orthogonal to each other. The dot product is zero, almost, because the dot product is not zero. The dot product, if you put an m in the middle and a k in the middle, you get zero. So this is not the kind of orthogonality that you were taught in linear algebra class, but it holds for vibration. The modes are mass orthogonal and stiffness orthogonal in this sense. Okay. In general, this is not true, though. Okay. Now, part C says, okay, what if I have, I gave, I gave you four initial conditions? Can you write the solution? Well, we found the two frequencies and we found the two modes. So, these are the initial condition, initial displacement, initial velocity is given to you. This was the form of the solution one way, or I could have combined these two, could have combined these two, so that A1 and A2 and phi1 and phi2 are unknown, instead of A, B, C, and D. So I'm going to use this. First of all, you know, uh, you know the initial condition, for example, t equal to zero. If you set t equal to zero in this expression, you know that this vector should be one and zero, okay? Uh, let's write down what we know. We found u1 and we found u2, the modes we found. This one went with root two, this one went with two. I just want to double check on that. Please, can you, I'm going to back up for a second. One third and one went with root two. I'm, I'm sorry, I have to back up. One third and one went with root two, right there. And minus one third and one went with uh, two. So let's go back here. And I'm really sorry about this. One third and one went with root two minus one third and one went with two. Okay, so uh, now we set t equal to z. Well, we need to take the derivative of this also because there is a condition that we need on the uh, initial condition on derivative. So I take this thing and I differentiate it, or I take this after I plug in your values u1 and u2 as vectors and differentiate it. I get this. Now I'm going to set t equal to zero and set this thing equal to 1 and 0, and t equal to 0 in here, set it equal to 0 and 0, I get, for your convenience, written again. Okay, this is the derivative. At t equal to 0, this whole shebang, when t is 0, which reduces to this is 1 and 0, right there, and this whole shebang, when t is 0, is 0 and 0, which is this. Four equation, four unknowns, by hooks or by crooks, you have to solve. This is one equation, these are two equations, these are the other two equations. This one is that top one, these two is that bottom one. Somehow you have to solve, somehow. And you're going to get this. So now that you have A1 and A2, you have the number A1 here, you have the number A2 there, you have phi1 and you have phi 2, and you can plug these things in, and you get your, uh, uh, yeah, you get your uh, solution, right, right there. 
Now notice that we have something plus pi over 2, so we wrote it, I, I, Inman, Inman decided to write these things, get rid of the phase, and write it in terms of sine becomes cosine, this sine becomes cosine, etc. So, uh, yeah. and we have plotted it. So the red one is the motion of the mass 1 as a function of time, and the blue one is the motion of mass 2 as a function of time. You have to use matrices. If it's a two degree of freedom system, it's, these are going to be two by two matrices. If it's three degrees of freedom system, it's going to be three by three matrices. And of course, n degrees of freedom, n by n matrices. Now you can see why I did not want to call omega n, because there will be a confusion between, is it the number of degrees of freedom that this guy is talking about, or is it natural frequency that the guy is talking about? Omega n, use of omega n is a bad idea for these problems. Okay, so um, the one thing you want to notice is that if you look at the solution to this problem, both frequencies will participate. So the motion of mass 1 involve both frequencies. Motion of mass 2 involve both frequencies. However, if your initial condition, remember those four conditions? x dot at 0 and x of 0. If x of 0, that initial condition is one of the modes. U1, for example. U1 which was one-third and one, something like that. And initial velocity is zero. Believe me, you calculate this. Both of these will only involve that one frequency, which was with that mode that, that I was talking about. So here, if the initial condition, as far as displacement, is this mode, which corresponds to root two, and the initial velocity is zero, then if you repeated this, you get x1 equal to something times sine of root 2t, and x2 equal to root 2 against sine of, uh, sorry, not root 2, uh, sine of root 2t, okay? So if these are select initial positions are the modes of the vibration, first mode, then both mass will vibrate at a single frequency coming from that mode. If you took your initial condition to be this, this one with 2 rad per second, both masses will vibrate only with that frequency. Otherwise, both omega 1 and omega 2 are going to be present in your solution. Now, this is going to be one of your homework problem. Now, this is going to be one of your homework problem. When you think about it, this is exactly that problem, the problem that we did today, except that there was no, there were no dampers. There were no dampers. Okay, and there was nothing on this side. So K three is zero. If K three is zero, there's no spring here, basically and there are no damper. This is exactly that problem that we did just a minute ago. All right? And you have to do that as a homework when you do that. Now, then remember, I showed you as a block because blocks are easy to think. Translational blocks are easy to, to think. But here is a situation where you have uh, two disks. This is, these are, these are uh, rotational motion. These are torsional springs, okay? And the degrees of freedom, it's a two degree of freedom system. Uh, degrees of freedom are the angular positions. Okay. Some information is, you know, first of all, it says write the equation of motion. And once you wrote the equation of motion, suppose that these two are the same stiffness. Uh, for example, the same material, same length, same diameter, etc. And assume that the mass, uh, the, the, the mass moment of inertia, polar moment inertia of this is three times that. So work out the natural frequencies and the modes and things like this. 
So the equation of motion, again, draw the free body diagram. Okay, so let's, let's assume for the sake of argument, theta 1 is bigger than theta 2. So if you look at this thing, this, this trying to rotate, that spring says, no, 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 opposite. And uh, if, if uh, this spring also says, no, 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 no. Springs always resist motion. Springs always are opposite to the direction of motion, okay? And of course, for this one, it's going to be because we are assuming that these are massless, okay? So uh, on, on this disk, uh, it's going to be exactly the same number except in the opposite direction. And uh, write down uh, the sum of all the uh, sum of all the moments about this axis equal from for block one or for uh, disk one is j one theta one double dot. These are moments. This must be j theta double dot. Okay, and write the same thing for this fellow. You get that. We're going to clean this up by introducing a vector, rotation vector, which is theta 1 and theta 2. This is our rotation vector, the counterpart of the x vector, which has two components. And you clean it up, you get the mass matrix symmetric mass matrix. Now, these are, of course, because of rotational motion, the, the polar moment of inertias, okay? And uh, this one is the uh, same thing that we had before, equal to zero. This is the mass matrix. This is the stiffness matrix. Both are symmetric, as you can see. Now, uh, for the particular value that's given, it says J1 is 3J2. I've written it here, right there. So this is 3J2 and this is J2, right there. Of course, J2 is going to go with us because it's a number that we are to not hold what it is. And it is a, it's a value, it's a constant, but you uh, just have to carry it, that's all. And you're told that K1 and K2 are the same, so this K1 plus K2 because 2K. So the K can come out. So there is your mass matrix, equivalent mass matrix. So there is your equivalent stiffness matrix. I say equivalent because this is a torsional uh, spring. Now, you follow the rule. Determinant of minus omega squared m plus k equal to zero, but it's not m, it's j. Okay? So just literally write it down. Write down matrix j. This is matrix j. Write down matrix k. This is matrix k. You're going to get something like that. Determinant is easy. The product of these two minus the product of those two. And solve it. We can solve it. Those are quadratic equations. We can solve it. And you're going to get this. These are the natural frequencies of vibration of those two, uh, of, of that two degree of rhythm system. Now, let's go ahead and find the first mode shape. So remember, you have to take the first frequency, put it in the expression of minus m or minus omega squared times m plus k times u equal to zero. And if you do that, you see that actually these are not two equations. These are the same equation. Therefore, we have freedom to decide to give one of these, choose one of these. So, for example, I can choose u12, this one to be one, and find u2, uh, u11 in terms of that. Now, for the second mode shape, Take the other frequency, remember the two frequencies, with those weird numbers in front of them. There was 2.33 and then uh, I think it was uh, 1.434, something like that, in front of them. Just literally put the second one in there. Again, these are two equations, but they're identical equations. One is a multiple of the other one. So it's really one equation which looks like that. You have a freedom to choose, for example, the second component, and you're going to get the first component out of it. So these are the modes, vibration modes, torsional vibration modes, which means eigenvectors of that particular problem. Now, this is a different problem. Notice that there is no spring to the left of this J1. So it's essentially two discs attached with a spring. A spring in the middle. So this is almost the same problem, except that there is no spring to the left of this attached to the wall. Okay, no problem. Now, 
we can go to the previous problem and set this the stiffness of this spring to the left equal to zero. So I can salvage whatever I have done by setting k1 equal to zero and k2, this is k2 equal to, ah, okay, no problem. So if you do that, this doesn't change. J doesn't change. It's the same J matrix. This one does because K1 is 0, so there's no such a thing here. It looks like that. And K2 is K. Okay, fine. There is going to be your equation. Determinant of omega squared times the mass matrix, equivalent mass matrix, plus the surface matrix equal to 0. And you're going to get, you just look at this, when you solve it, when you solve it, you're going to get omega 1 equal to 0 and omega 2 equal to 1.155, set the square root of k over j2. Now, when you think about this thing, this makes sense because this can rotate as a rigid body. In addition to vibration with that frequency, it can also rotate as a rigid body without any essentially oscillation. And that's what this thing is telling me. So there is rigid body motion. When there's a rigid body motion involved, there's always a zero frequency. And the other one is, of course, is the, the oscillation frequency. In other words, let's hypothetically say I took this thing, grabbed the left, left disc, rotated the right disc, and let it go. Both will start to oscillate, and... It's going to be at that frequency. Essentially, it's a, this essentially can be viewed as a, uh, it's, it's not a single degree of freedom system, but anyway, one of the frequencies is zero. Let's find the first mode. Okay, so we take that first mode, omega equal to zero, plug it in there. What do I mean by plug it in there? To find the mode, you go and put it in the equation. Minus omega squared times A, M, plus k times u equal to zero. That's what I've done. Okay? Except that because omega is zero first mode, omega m squared is not going to come into the picture. It's just k u equal to zero. And of course, you're going to get these are the same equation. You're going to get rigid body mode, rotation of the same amount of the two disks, one and one, or two and two, or minus three and minus three. Okay? For the other one, just literally go ahead and plug in that other value of omega and write it down. Okay? You're going to get 1 and minus 3. Okay? So, uh, let's uh, look at another problem that we want to do. We have another 4 or 5 slides. Let me just take a quick break here. Okay, quick break means a sip of water. So this looks uh, familiar to you, right? When you take a car, the simplest model of a car is take the mass of the entire car going up and down. So it's a single degree of freedom system. And then, uh, you know, suspension system, you know, the, um, uh, the stiffness, uh, the shocks, etc. It's a single degree of freedom system. We have done problems like this. But it is also possible to view this thing as having two degrees of freedom. Bounce up and down, down which is exactly this, but the pitch, okay? This thing can pitch about the CG uh, as a straight line. So, essentially, we have this situation. So, there's a CG of the car. It can go up and down. But this car, if we viewed it as the chassis, as this straight line, it can actually can rotate. So, this has two degrees of freedom. Angle theta and motion of the CG up and down. Okay? Now... If you think about it, when uh, this thing comes down, the CG comes down, and this thing rotates in the clockwise direction, uh, the the amount of stretching, the amount of uh, the, this displacement, actually, you can see that that displacement is going to be x minus l1t because l1t 
Uh, remember, this is coming down and this is going up. So one is positive, the other one is negative when you look at this corner system, okay? So this is x minus L1t, and on the other hand, this one is x plus L2t. You can see that this is coming down by the amount x, but this rod is also rotating, and this amount is L2, that length, times this angle theta. So when you, when you look at this, you can write some of all the some of all the forces in the vertical direction equal to mass times acceleration of the car, and some of all the moments about the CG equal to the inertia of the car, polar moment of inertia of the car, J of the car, times the theta double dot. We have done things like that, except that uh, uh, this is a two degree of freedom system. So. Uh, we're assuming that there are small angle oscillations, therefore that length is L2 theta and this length is L1 theta, etc. So, as I said, sum of all the forces in the vertical direction, in the x direction, equal to mass times acceleration, mass of the car times acceleration. Sum of all the moments coming from different forces that are uh, have these the sources equal to uh, uh, sum of all the moments equal to J of the car about the CG times theta double dot. Okay, so here's the situation. This is the same diagram, repeated for your convenience. Some of all the forces, what are the forces that are acting? Okay, there is the, the damping force, vertical damping force. It's derivative of this times C1, right there. And there's a spring force spring force, okay, which is right here. Spring force always is the motion. Damping force always is the motion. So this is the spring force, the spring on the left. This is the damping force, the damper on the left. And we also have the same thing on the right side, okay. They're both negative, as you can see. This is negative. C2 is negative. The coefficient of C2 is negative. But the amount of the velocity on the right is the derivative of this, which is right here. Derivative of this thing is right there. And the amount of uh, compression on the right side is x plus L2t. So resist the motion of this bar going, trying to go down. And you do the same thing, same forces, but moment about Cg. And please go ahead and, and do it yourself because it is just a, you know, for example, if you look at this hypothetically, the, the moment of the stamping force, you have to multiply it by the moment arm, which is uh, L1, right? L1, right there. This is the moment arm of the damping force here. For the spring force right there, again L1. For this stamping force, the moment arm is L2. And for that spring force, the moment arm is all L2. So patiently write the moments of these forces about the CG, which means you're going to have these moment arms, equal to J theta double dot. J is, if you look at the car, it's represented with this line. Okay, and obviously there is a mass distribution along it, so we are assuming that somehow the the the, the mass moment of inertia of uh, uh, the polar moment of inertia of the mass distribution of the car is given by a single number, which is called J. Well, let's assume that the uh, well, since it, it may be easier for somebody to give us the uh, the uh, radius of gyration of the car chassis, radius, the relationship between radius of gyration and the polar moment of inertia of the car is just mass of the car times that radius. So if somebody gave us R somehow, they said the radius of gyration of the vehicle is R, I just take the mass of it, multiply it by R squared, and play, use it as J. So there we are. If you, if you get rid of J instead of writing it as M R squared, this is the equivalent mass matrix. This is the equivalent damping matrix. And this is the equivalent stiffness matrix. Somehow, 
we have to solve this equation. This is the equation of motion, and we have three weeks to do it, and we will. So essentially, if we ignore damping, because we haven't really decided on what to do with damping, if we ignore damping, these, this matrix go away, and this is not any different from the previous two problems that we did. Okay, there's a mass matrix, there's a surface matrix, x equal to zero. So we have, as I said, the next three weeks is precisely solving things of this type. But I want to digress a little bit and ask you a question. Go back to your first year calculus class. Somebody gave you these two, an integral like that and an integral like that. And it said, he or she said, your instructor said, which one do you like better? to calculate. If you had a choice of doing this or that, which one would you say? You look at this and say, oh my God, this is a disaster. Well, I'm not going to go with this. I know the integral of e to the x is e to the x, and then plug in the upper and lower limit. But most people will pick the top one. But these, if you make a change of variable, you see, this is, this is what scared you. x squared minus x is scared you. If you call it q, this thing, 2x minus 1 dx is just the derivative of that q. In other words, if you call this thing q, dq dx is 2x minus 1. So these two actually are the same. This thing is exactly e to the q dq. Of course, the limits are good. So isn't that the same? But it's the nature of human beings. Uh, it scares me. Let me do this. But in a simple change of variable will actually give you the same integral. Same thing, just, not, just the limits are different. Now I have another question along the same line. Well, put yourself in the differential equations course a year later. Somebody gives you this, and somebody gives you that. So which one do you prefer? You're going to say, OK, let me write these things down, see what they say. If you look at this, just, just literally multiply this thing by that, multiply this thing by that, equal to 0. Multiply this by the second row, this by the second row, equal to 0. So it looks like that. Repeat it for down here. Hmm. You look at this, you say, wait a minute, there's no x2 here. And you look at this, you say, ooh, there's no x1 here. So obviously, I'm not going to do this. Because this has x1 and x2 in the same line. But this one has no x, x2 and this one has no x1. So these are uncoupled. These are coupled. I can solve these. I mean, the first, the first three weeks of the course, the first six weeks of the course, basically has been stuff like that. As a matter of fact, when the right-hand side is zero, we have solved this thing so many times. But this one, they're coupled. You have a problem. So... The question is, can I change a variable just like I did in the previous problem so that these two equations become uncoupled? And the answer is yes. And the trick is this change of variable instead of x, use another vector q. This matrix is going to be a 2 by 2 matrix. And in it, you have your modes. Eigenvectors.